Good evening. My name is Jim Tyson. I'm the 2021 president of the Texas Navy Association. I'd like to welcome you tonight to the webinar, The Battle of Campeche, by noted author and historian Jonathan Jordan. Tonight's presentation is being brought to you through generous donations of the Texas Maritime Museum in Rockport, Texas. We invite you to go visit them and enjoy. In the meantime, I'm going to pass you off to the MC for the night, and that's Admiral Jerry Patterson. Jerry is the previous president of the Texas Navy Association, as well as the governor's representative. So, Jerry. Thank you, Admiral Tyson. Tonight, the Texas Navy brings you a webinar about the little known, underappreciated, but heroic Texas Navy of 1836 to 1846. Our subject is the 1843 Battle of Campeche. Our presenter is Jonathan W. Jordan, the award-winning author of Lone Star Navy, Texas, the fight for the Gulf of Mexico, and the shaping of the American West. Among Mr. Jordan's other works are studies of the American and Allied high commands in World Wars I and II, and his recent work, published in 2020 and co-authored with his daughter, Emily Ann Jordan, War Queens, Extraordinary Women Who Ruled the Battlefield. Mr. Jordan is a native of Savannah, Georgia, and now resides in Atlanta, where he practices commercial litigation and bankruptcy law. He has an accounting degree from Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, and a law degree from Vanderbilt. He previously practiced law in Dallas, and he was commissioned an admiral in the Texas Navy by Governor Rick Perry. Well, let's get underway. Admiral Jordan, you have the helm. Thank you to the Texas Navy Association, and thank you especially to the Texas Maritime Museum, which is where I conducted a good bit of the research for the book Lone Star Navy. Tonight's presentation centers on a naval battle that few people have heard of, but it changed the course of the American history, American West. In an extraordinary example of the butterfly effect, two wooden sailing ships and an intrepid naval captain dramatically changed the history of Texas the fate of three nations, and the map of the American West. So tonight, let's have some fun talking about sailing ships, flying cannonballs, and a Texas naval commander whom Sam Houston wanted to hang for piracy. We begin with the map of three nations shortly after the Texas Revolution. As you can see here in the colored part of the map, Mexico, even without Texas, was the size of a regional empire. It ran from the Yucatan Peninsula, the land of the Mayan people, through the Aztec Empire, the Sonoran Desert, Comanche lands, and as far as the border of the Oregon Territory. Mexico had a population of around 7 million souls and a regular army and navy. Its challenge, however, was that the regional empire was so big, it was very difficult for the central government in Mexico City to control. An internal struggle soon pitted the centralistas, who wished for a strong central government, against the federalistas, who wanted control at the state and local levels. Next to Mexico in the map, of course, is Texas, not really well defined at the time, and of course to the right of that is the United States. The Texas Republic was brand new. It had nearly limitless potential but it was being pulled between two conflicting visions of what Texas should become. Sam Houston, Texas's first president, was an American unionist at heart. A protege of Andrew Jackson, Houston's vision for Texas was as a state that would be annexed to the United States. 
Until the United States was politically ready to annex Texas, however, the hero of San Jacinto felt that Texas should tread very carefully. Houston did not want Texas pr provoking the Comanche Indians out to the west, and he definitely did not want Texas provoking Mexico. Houston was a fiscal conservative who understood that an army and navy cost a lot of money to maintain, and he didn't want scarce government funds being spent on a military. His goal, as you see here, was fewer officers and more cornfields. The diametrically opposed vision was that of Mirabeau Lamar, Texas's second president and Sam Houston's successor. Lamar felt that Texas should act and behave as a regional power. After all, Texas had millions of acres of land, fertile farmlands, and it produced a lot of cotton. So it had potential and it had the means to support itself and in time become a genuine economic power. On the foreign policy front, Lamar advocated a tough line against the Comanches and he provoked them into a series of raids in central Texas. He also supported Mexican states along the Rio Grande River and in southern Mexico that wished to break away from the central government. To make Texas great again, President Lamar planned to build up the Texas Army and Naval Forces. And to pay for those soldiers and guns, ships and sailors, he had the government issue promissory notes, which you see here, nicknamed Redbacks. They were basically paper money with little or nothing to back them up. Now, the Gulf of Mexico played a vital role in the military and economic struggle between Texas and Mexico. The biggest geographical fact of the Texas Revolution is that a straight line from Mexico City to Galveston, the heart of revolution, runs right across the Gulf of Mexico. During the revolution, you can see the red lines where Santa Ana's army marched overland across Texas and where the sea routes from Veracruz, Mexico's main port, would run toward Galveston. The blue lines on the map show supply routes for volunteer troops, weapons, ammunition, and equipment running from Mobile and New Orleans to Galveston. Now, by 1837, Mexico still did not recognize Texas independence. So the Mexican Navy had been thinking from 1837 to about 1841 about how to cut those blue lines. So the control of the Gulf of Mexico was vital if you wanted to invade or defend Texas. But it wasn't just military considerations that made the Gulf of Mexico valuable. Once Texas was established as a country, Mexico and Texas had to worry about their trade routes. Here, the blue and red lines show Mexico's and Texas's sea lines from their main commercial ports. If you are a Sam Houston, you're mostly concerned about making the blue lines work to Texas unimpeded. But if you are a Mirabeau Lamar with an aggressive foreign policy toward Mexico, then you might think about trying to cut those red lines in order to force Mexican recognition of an independent Texas. Now, Mexico thought that Texas was basically an ungrateful province that it would recapture and reconquer as soon as it could. But one reason Mexico was unable to do that was because Yucatan, the peninsula to the farthest, uh, the farthest portion of Mexico, uh, had declared itself to be an independent republic. Yucatan lay far away from Mexico City and its leaders believed in a weak central government with a lot of power by the states. Taking a cue from Texas, the Yucatecos revolted in February of 1840 and Mexico had to commit troops and ships to put down the revolt before the government could turn its attention back to Texas. Since the jungles of Tabasco in the south were impassable, the only practical way that Mexico City could move troops into Yucatan was by controlling the southern portion of the Gulf of Mexico. And that's where the Texas Navy comes in. Now, before we get into the story of wooden ships and iron men, let's put the navies that controlled the Gulf of Mexico into, into perspective. The Gulf had a very shallow series of ports at that time. 
The bar guarding Galveston Bay was then only about eight and a half feet at low tide. Matagorda, Matamoros, and Tampico were also very shallow ports, so there were really no major deep water ports between Veracruz and New Orleans. That fact limited the size of ships that could sail in the Gulf. So tonight we're not going to be talking about the mammoth 120-gun Spanish men of war or the 104-gun battleships of the Royal Navy like the HMS Victory. We're not even talking about ships the size that the U.S. Navy preferred. Uh, from the early 19th century, you can see here from this picture that the U.S. relied on 44-gun frigates like the USS Constitution. So what was the Texas Navy like? Well, do you see that little two-masted schooner off in the background? That was a typical Texas Navy warship. It wasn't even properly called a ship, since a ship is supposed to have three masts, and these schooners had two. So for the most part, tonight we're going to be talking about small, shallow draft vessels drawing around eight feet of water, with a couple of notable exceptions, the heavyweights that fought in a very important battle. So let's take a look at the Texas Navy. The flagship was the Austin built in Baltimore under a six-ship six contract with the shipbuilding firm of Frederick Dawson and Sons. She had a crew of about 300 and carried 20 guns, two long 18-pounders, meaning they fired an 18-pound cannonball, and an 1824-pounders. So with three masts, the Austin was actually the only war vessel of the Texas Navy that you could properly call a ship. The next largest vessels were the brigs, which have two masts and they are square rigged, meaning that the sails run perpendicular to the hull. Uh, fans of Patrick O'Brien's novels might recognize this picture. It's an illustration of the brig Sophie, and it's a pretty good representation of what the armed Texas Navy brigs looked like. The two war brigs for Texas were also built by Dawson and Sons. Uh, that company, by the way, charged the Texas Republic $280,000 for the six ships they built. Those ships were paid for by Texas bonds, promissory notes, basically. And if the Republic failed to make good on the promise to pay, then there was a 100% penalty the Republic would have to pay. Now, it didn't seem to occur to Mr. Dawson that if Texas couldn't afford to pay $280,000, it probably couldn't afford to pay 560000 either, but that was the way the contract worked. Well, the two fighting brigs were each pierced for 18 guns. The first was the Branch Archer, named after a commissioner uh, from, who went to New Orleans to help with the first Texas Navy uh, and acquire those ships. Uh, the Archer carried 16 medium 18-pounder guns and her sister ship was the Colorado, who was renamed the Wharton after John or William Wharton, William being another commissioner. Now there was a, another brig that we won't talk too much about, it's the Potomac, a holdover from the original Texas Navy from the time of the Revolution. Uh, Potomac served as a harbor vessel in Galveston and was never fitted out to go out into combat, but they needed a, a brig to move supplies around the Galveston Navy Yard. Well, the last three sailing vessels were the workhorses of the Texas Navy. These were the two-masted schooners. Uh, the schooners had their, their uh, canvas running fore and aft, meaning that the sails, the main sails, run parallel with the hull. Now, the Texas schooners were a little different because they also had these square top sails running up at the top. So that's why they were called topsail schooners. And because they were built in Baltimore, where they like to make the masts lean backwards, they're sometimes referred to as Baltimore schooners. The advantage of schooners was that they could be worked with a smaller crew. They were fast, maneuverable, and they were able to move in and out of river mouths and shallow bays like at Matagorda. They could also cross oceans. The schooners acted as scouts, courier vessels, and escorts. Basically, the schooners were to the Navy what cavalry was to the Army. On the left, we see a contemporary drawing of the Texas Schooner of War San Antonio, and on the right is a picture of a Texas topsail schooner depicted on a Texas $100 bill. Uh, Lamar's administration loved pictures of ships, 
and they put them on practically all their money. Well, the Texas Navy of 1840 had three schooners, the San Antonio, the San Bernard, and the San Jacinto. Their weaponry changed over time, but generally they had three 12-pounder cannons on each side and one long 18-pounder gun on, the, on a pivot mount in the middle. So they had a pretty good armament for such small ships. Here's another picture of a schooner, which gives you a better idea of how big they were. They were usually around 70 feet long, and they had one deck, so about the size of a nice yacht. The last member of the Texas Navy was the steamship Zavala, named after Texas Vice President Lorenzo de Zavala. Zavala was a Philadelphia-built side-wheel steamer originally named the Charleston. She did not carry many guns, and there are different accounts of how many guns she did carry. But her real value was that her engines could move her very fast at the speed of 16 knots. She could run for 24 days on a load of good Pittsburgh coal, and she could tow larger ships like the Austin into firing positions when the enemy ships were stranded from lack of wind. It was also felt that when there was no fighting to be done in the Gulf of Mexico, the Zavala could make some money for the government by working as a mail and passenger steamer between Galveston and New Orleans. Well, because there were very few steamers in any of the navies, the steam frigate Zavala gave the Texas Navy a technological edge in fighting in the Gulf. The only other steam warship, the U.S. Navy's Fulton II, would be decommissioned in 1842 after an experimental gun burst, killing her crew. Well, the leader of the Texas Navy was Post Captain Edwin Ward Moore. Born in 1808, Edward Ward Moore was a U.S. Navy lieutenant who had served in U.S. waters and in the Mediterranean in sloops of war like the USS Boston. He was an exceptional seaman, courageous, intellectually curious, and fluent in Spanish. In the peacetime U.S. Navy, promotions were painfully slow, and it might be years before Moore made the rank of commander, much less the rank of post captain. Now, as an aside, captain at the time wasn't really a rank, it was a title of respect. Post captain was actually the name of the rank, and it was for a captain who commanded a ship. And back then, the American and Texas navies didn't have any admirals, so post captain was as high as you could get. Well, President Lamar authorized Moore's commission as post captain in 1839, and because he commanded a squadron of warships, Post Captain Moore was referred to by most historians as Commodore Moore. Well, Commodore Moore was as much a believer in Texas power as President Lamar was. Moore felt that the Navy could do a lot to protect Texas from Mexico, and it could use its power to cripple Mexican commerce and eventually force Mexico into recognition of Texas independence. So by the summer of 1840, Texas had an impressive fleet one larger than Mexico's Navy, and one more technologically advanced than the U.S. Navy. But what a difference three years makes. It's one thing to build a fleet. It's another thing to keep the ships in good working order. Texas promised to pay $280,000 for its fleet, but when it bought it, it had no money left to pay for their upkeep. The Texas government had to let go sailors whom they couldn't pay and they began cannibalizing parts from some ships to keep other ships afloat. Moreover, Sam Houston became Texas's president again in 1841, and during his second term, he basically cut off funds for the Navy, reasoning that the Navy was too expensive and would only be a provoca provocation against Mexico. So as 1843 opened, the three schooners were gone. San Jacinto was lost in a storm in the Gulf. San Antonio's crew mutinied. They killed one of their officers, and although the mutineers were captured and locked up in New Orleans, the ship was lost at sea in 1842. The San Bernard was in Galveston, but it was rotting for lack of any funds to keep it up. It began taking on water, and the crew finally left because the government could not afford to feed, clothe, or pay them. The same thing happened to the bridge Archer and to the steamer Zavala. 
that technological marvel began to settle into the mud in Galveston's harbor, and it would be lost and covered up by the bay's shifting sands for many years. In the 1980s, adventurer novelist Clive Cussler, by the way, who was a big fan of the Texas Navy, funded an archaeological expedition, and he eventually found the Zavala underneath a parking lot in Galveston Island. Well, Texas at that point, in uh, early 1843, was really left only with its flagship Austin and the brig Wharton. Both those ships were anchored in New Orleans, and Commodore Moore was using his personal credit and funds to hire sailors and pay for repairs, gunpowder, shot, food, and supplies. Well, while the Texas fleet rotted, Mexico was carefully rebuilding its navy. It had to control the Gulf to fight in either Yucatan or Texas, so it invested its money in two brigs, two schooners, and importantly, three steam warships. The heavyweight of all the warships is seen here, the Guadalupe, an iron-plated steamer built at the Birkenhead shipyard in Liverpool, England. Guadalupe was built for Britain's Royal Navy, but the British Admiralty wasn't too keen on the idea of having coal-fired fires uh, with engines uh, being stored or being worked around stores of thousands of pounds of gunpowder. So the company was ultimately uh, uh, had to sell the ship to Mexico rather than the Royal Navy. Texas ambassador tried to get the sale scrapped, but he was unsuccessful. And the ship crossed the ocean and was commissioned in the, tech, in the Mexican Navy in the summer of 1842. Well, Guadalupe was commanded by a Royal Navy commander, Edward Charlwood. Her crew was mostly British, but there were also a number of them who were Spanish and Mexican. Her hull was wrapped in iron plating, and Guadalupe had watertight compartments for safety, which was an in, in innovation at the time. She carried two 68-pounder guns that fired shells rather than solid shot. These were massive and far more formidable than the Texian's 24-pound solid cannonballs. No other warship in the world had these advantages in 1842. And with the acquisition of Guadalupe and her smaller sister steamer, the Moctezuma, Mexico now had the most technologically advanced fleet in the world. Well, by late 1842, Mexico was ready to take on Texas for round two, almost. In March of that year, General Rafael Vasquez invaded Texas and drove as far north as San Antonio. He quickly withdrew, but a larger force under General Adrian Wool, seen here on the left, invaded Texas in September with around 1,600 men. He also captured San Antonio, but he was driven back to Mexico at the Battle of Salado Creek. Santa Ana came back to power the following month. We see a picture of him here on the right. He was determined to take back Texas. Diplomats in London, Mexico City, and Washington all predicted that Mexico would make a full-on attempt to take Texas, probably in 1843. In a secret session of the Texas Congress in January 1843, Sam Houston warned of a dire threat from Mexico. Ashbel Smith, Texas's minister to London, concluded that Mexico wanted to drive the Texians out of uh, Texas. And while Americans uh, like Senator uh, Daniel Webster observed the situation, they predicted a Mexico um, invasion in 1843. But there was a catch. In 1842, Yucatan again declared its independence. Yucatan had a large ethnic Mayan population, and the Spaniard Mexicans who lived there favored a federalist system, not a centralized government like the one Santa Ana represented. So before Mexico City could invade Texas, it first had to pacify Yucatan. In 1842, Mexico sent a fleet over to Yucatan. Ships like the Moctezuma shuttled Mexican troops to lay siege to strong points on the peninsula, especially the capital of Merida and Campeche, its major port. Those troops had a tough time against the Yucatecos, and the Mexican troops relied on the, next, on the Mexican Navy to supply the soldiers and to keep supplies from reaching the rebels. 
Well, Commodore Moore saw an opportunity here. If he could keep the pot stirred in Yucatan, then Mexican troops would be so bogged down that they wouldn't be able to invade Texas. And if he could take out those tramps, those Mexican warships, they would not be able to transport soldiers to the Texas coast. Now, Moore was able to keep the Navy afloat without the need of government money because he used his own funds. And the Yucatan rebels had also agreed to provide $8,000 in silver, which they did in exchange for the use of the Texas Navy. But Sam Houston saw things differently. First of all, the president gets to make foreign policy, not his Navy commander. Second, Sam Houston did not want to antagonize Mexico through some crazy adventure hundreds of miles away. Most of all, the Texas Navy cost money, and Sam Houston was not going to fritter away Texas's meager funds on a Navy that it couldn't afford and most importantly, that the president could not control. Now, Sam Houston, as we know, was not a man to let anybody question his authority. He was a seasoned politician who loved to bully other politicians. He knew how to intimidate people. Uh, one example we see is with his signature. When he signed his name, Sam Houston, he would sometimes put a little space between the S in his name so that it looked like it read, I am Houston. Well, Sam Houston had a secret law passed in January 1843 authorizing the sale of the Texas Navy's ships. He ordered Commodore Moore to turn over the Navy's ships to his second in command, and then he ordered whoever the second in command was to obey the instructions of the two civilian commissioners, William Bryan and James Morgan. Houston instructed his commissioners to go to New Orleans and take the Texas Navy ships back to Galveston so they could decommission them and sell them at auction. When J Commissioner James Morgan arrived in New Orleans in early 1843, he expected to see some rundown ships with basically half-starved pirates as the crew. But he found the Austin to be in wonderful shape thanks to personal loans Moore had taken out to fund the Navy during its time of starvation. When James Morgan told Com Commodore Moore uh, that they were going back to Galveston, Moore said he would obey those orders. But he also told the commissioners that if they did obey the orders, the ship's crews were going to desert because they had no faith in the government to pay them. The ships would be worthless. Meanwhile, the Mexican Navy was blockading Campeche to the south, and once Mexico had defeated the Yucatan rebels, they would turn their guns against Texas. Well, Morgan, the lead commissioner, thought about it, and he agreed with Moore. They heard some more information from ships coming into New Orleans about how, the, uh, about how at Yucatan the Mexican Navy was down there in force, and that Mexico would soon launch an invasion against Texas. So Morgan ordered Commodore Moore to return to Galveston with one tiny little detour. They were going to Yucatan. Well, the Austin and Wharton left New Orleans on April 19, and they headed for the port of Telchac, where Commodore Moore had heard the Moctezuma was operating by itself. But the Mexican Commodore, Francisco, Lopez, Francisco de Paulo Lopez, had been warned about the approaching Texians, and he sent his schooner Aguila to bring the Moctezuma back to Campeche, where the fleet was waiting. Moore missed his opportunity of capturing Moctezuma by 24 hours, so he sailed down the coast. On the morning of April 30th, Austin and Wharton spotted the Mexican fleet, consisting of the big steamers Guadalupe and Moctezuma, the smaller steamer known as Regenerador, the brigs Santana and Yucateco, and the schooners Aguila, Iman, and Campechiano. That's a total of 59 guns among those ships. The Texans were joined by a small Yucatan squadron, consisting of the schooners Independencia and Siciliano, and four very small gunboats. So the Texas-Yucatan coalition carried a total of 50 guns, but the problem was they were all much smaller than the big behemoths carried by the steamers of the Mexican fleet. Eyewitness accounts of the battle are sparse, 
But fortunately, we have the ship's logs that we can uh, that read to tell us what happened at each minute of the battle. At 7.05 a.m. on the morning of April 30th, Commodore Moore ordered his colors hoisted and ran straight for the Moctezuma, which appeared to be stuck on a sandbar. Moctezuma extricated herself, and at 7.20, Commodore Lopez attacked in strength. At 7.35, the steamers began firing from three miles away, though they were still a little bit out of range, even for their guns. At 7.50, Commodore Moore swung his flagship around and let loose a broadside, driving the steamers back a little bit, a respectable distance. The Mexican schooners tried to come around behind the Texas squadron and attack them from that side, but broadsides from the Austin drove them off. At 8.10, Austin and Wharton finally got close to the Guadalupe and opened fire, but the Mexican steamers back paddled and made use of the longer range of their 68 pounders. The battle went into a lull about 20 min 25 minutes later when the Texas squadron and the Yucatan fleet sailed back a little bit closer to the roadstead at Campeche. About two hours later, the Mexican steamers moved close and the Austin began trading shots with Guadalupe and Moctezuma. One heavy shot from Guadalupe smashed through Austin's deck, but the steamers were out of range for the most part, so there really wasn't much that Commodore Moore could do except return back to Campeche and drop anchor. His guns just could not reach. On his way back in, Moore struck ground momentarily, and the steamers, sensing an opportunity, crept forward and began shelling his ship. But the Yucatan squadron sailed out and peppered Guadalupe and Moctezuma. Under the cover of the Yucatecos, the, st the steamers pulled back, Moore was able to extricate himself, and the engagement that day was over. One Texas midshipman heard that the Guadalupe had lost seven men killed and many, many injured, while Moctezuma lost her captain and 14 men. That's a bit of an exaggeration. The truth is that Moctezuma's captain, Richard Cleveland of the Royal Navy, had died of tropical fever, probably yellow fever, shortly before, as did several of his crewmen. But the Mexican ships truly did suffer some considerable damage. Well, for the next couple of weeks, the two sides would play cat and mouse off Campeche. But time was not on the side of the Mexicans. Their soldiers were running out of food and they could not replace their losses from desertion or disease. The Yucatan rebels had been re-energized by the naval battle and they began going on the offensive against the centralistas on land. Those centralist troops began deserting in droves. Commodore Paula Lopez was recalled to Mexico City and court-martialed, and he was replaced by Tomas Francisco de Paula Marín Zalbaza, better known as Tomas Marín. Well, Commodore Marín was also running out of time. His English crews were dying from yellow fever at the rate of three or four per day, and if he could not defeat the Texas Navy, then the diplomats were going to have to agree to some kind of accommodation with Yucatan. The Mexican squadron had to take sailors from the smaller ships to fill out the crews of the big steamers, and by May 15th, Commodore Marine's fleet was down to the Guadalupe, the Moctezuma, and the schooner Aguila. Well, during that period between May 1 and May 15, Moore would sail his ships out of Campeche's roadstead, but the breeze was never good enough to allow him to close with the Mexican squadron. Moore tried to increase the range of his guns by borrowing a couple of long-range 18-pounders from Campeche's castle, an old colonial fort that was built to defend it from Captain Morgan and other pirates. Uh, he mounted those guns on the Austin's gun deck. Finally, on the morning of May 16, Commodore Marine decided to give battle. When Austin and Wharton sailed out, they closed within two and a half miles, and the Mexicans opened fire. The breeze was not strong enough to let the Texians get close, and the Mexican steamers back paddled to try to lure Moore out in, into the open. Moore sat there and ran up his Texas colors, daring Marine to come back and fight him. Two hours later, Commodore Marine took the, up the challenge. He ran up three naval jacks, the Union Jack to symbolize his British crewmen, 
the Spanish ensign for his Castilian crewmen, and the Mexican ensign. In reply, Moore ran up the Union Jack, and he ran up the Stars and Stripes. So we had a lot of flags going at this battle. Well, at 10.55 a.m., Guadalupe began shelling the Austin. The Texas ships answered with a broadside, and Wharton's shots cut the Guadalupe's flagstaff and sent its flag over into the water. Aguila ran in and sent some shots at the Austin, wounding three men, but Moore drove the schooner off with a broadside from his 24-pounders. Then Guadalupe's gunners began to find their range. First two shots hit Moore's flagship, then the Moctezuma joined in. Well, under those shells, Moore was a sitting duck, but just after noon, a light breeze blew him forward, and he was able to run right between the two enemy steamers. His gunners opened up on both sides of the ship. Aguila fled, but Guadalupe held fast and returned fire. Shells from both steamers began pounding the Austin, and Texas sailors had arms and legs taken off by exploding shells and roaring cannonballs. For an hour, the Mexican ships tore into the Austin, but the Texians sat there under fire and gave as good as they got. But by three o'clock in the afternoon, both sides were exhausted. The Austin had fired 530 rounds at her opponents, while the Wharton's long-range 12-pounder alone had fired 65 shots. The steamers were running out of ammunition, and they began to back off, a perfect opportunity for more, but so much of his rigging was cut that he just couldn't give chase. The two sides drew off. In the Battle of Campeche the, on May 16th, Austin lost three men killed and 21 wounded. Wharton only lost one man. Uh, he was a, a victim of an accidental gun discharge. It was a sailor who was reloading the cannon while his negligent gun captain fired on him. Losses on the Mexican side are impossible to know for certain. The Texians embellished what they heard of Mexican losses, and Commodore Moore said that he heard Guadalupe had 47 killed and 30 wounded, while the Moctezuma lost her captain and 40 others. Well, the biggest loss to Mexico really was the loss of many of the English crewmen. After the Battle of Campeche, they had no appetite to die from Texas shot or tropical parasites, and most of them refused to re-enlist with Mexico. So who won the Battle of Campeche? In the end, Commodore Moore could not destroy the Mexican squadron. But Mexico needed a big win in Yucatan to move against Texas, and Commodore Tomas Marín definitely did not destroy the Texas-Yucatan coalition. Tactically, the battle was a draw, but strategically, it was a big win for Texas. Well, one man who didn't think it was a big win for Texas was Sam Houston. When Sam found out that his ships had sailed for Yucatan instead of coming home to be sold, he published a pronunciation, a proclamation denouncing Moore as, and his crewmen as pirates. He asked for all the governments of Christendom to arrest Moore and his men so that they could be tried and punished in Texas. Houston thought that hanging was the right cure for a man like Commodore Moore. Houston issued his proclamation days before Moore would save Texas from possible invasion off the, bat, the coast of Campeche. Well, Commodore Moore promptly returned to Galveston, where the Navy was very popular because Galveston was on the front line of any amphibious invasion. The town came out and gave the sailors a hero's welcome and threw them banquets. Moore went directly to the local sheriff and offered to place himself under arrest, given Houston's proclamation. But the sheriff of Galveston was no idiot, and he knew he'd be run out of town on a rail if he tried to arrest a war hero. In the end, Moore was court-martialed, but he was acquitted of all but one trivial count, and he was never punished. But Houston and his successor, President Anson Jones, relieved Moore of command. Commodore Moore and Sam Houston hated each other till the end of their days, and Moore challenged Houston to a duel at one point. Moore published a pamphlet called To the People of Texas, in which he collected orders, letters, and ship logs describing the Battle of Campeche to defend his reputation. 
the pamphlet was actually published with uh, annotations by Southern Methodist University's Library of Texas. The Texas Navy, as Houston desired, was auctioned off at Galveston's pier. But a mob gathered at the pier and threatened to kill anyone who bought the ships or bid, even bid on them. So the ship sat in Galveston Harbor, government property, slowly rotting and taking on water until they were eventually taken over by the United States Navy two years later as property of the, of the U.S. government from Texas annexation. Well, what about the effects of the Battle of Campeche? Well, the battle itself prevented Mexico from being able to invade Texas a second time. This was an invasion that Mexico probably would have made from the sea, like they should have done the first time. A mass army landing at Galveston, learning the lessons of the 1836 revolution, would have had an excellent chance of returning Texas to the Mexican fold. Because they had to finish things in Yucatan, however, the Mexican government had no ability to reinvade Texas until the movement for annexation in the United States began to gain momentum in 1844 and 1845. Had Mexico invaded Texas in 1843, it is unlikely the U.S. would have invaded and tried to wrest Texas back into independence. The U.S. did not have the troop strength to do it in the Southwest, nor did they have the political unity that would require. But Mexico had to leave Texas alone during those crucial years, and by 1845, a treaty of annexation bound Texas to the United States. In February 1846, the Texas flag was hauled down over the Texian capital, and the stars and stripes were raised. The Austin, Wharton, and what was left of the other vessels were turned over to the United States Navy. Well, the annexation of Texas, a byproduct of Texas resistance at Campeche in 1843, led to war with Mexico in 1846. The war ended in a decisive American victory and resulted in the loss of Mexican lands in what is now New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, and California. So in a very real sense, the Battle of Campeche shaped the way the map of America looks today. But annexation also altered the political balance of power in the United States between the slave states and the free states. As you can see here, before Texas annexation, there were 14 free states and 14 slave states. Texas became the 15th slave state, and all those new states created by the war with Mexico created a major political crisis over whether they should be abolitionist states or slave states. As you can see here uh, from this, uh, uh, this announcement in 1838, long before Texas abolition, uh, annexation, the abolitionists in the North worried that Texas annexation would create more slave states and challenge the balance of power in Congress. The acquisition of so much territory from Mexico meant that the slave problem would become that much more acute of a political problem, and we all know what eventually happened. Well, big events sometimes flower from small incidents. An assassin's bullet started the First World War. Gunners in South Carolina launched the American Civil War. And in many ways, the small, almost unheard of Battle of Campeche changed the course of Texas history and thereby the history of the United States. Thank you very much. John. Thank you very much. That's a tremendous presentation. We appreciate it a lot. My name is Andy Hall. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, uh, Texas Navy Association. I'm a member of the Board of Directors, uh, and I'm also a, uh, uh, an officer with the Charles Hawkins Squadron uh, in Galveston. Um, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for taking time to be with us tonight. We, uh, uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, one that I'd like to get to right off the bat is, how did you end up being interested in the Texas Navy? It's a little bit of an obscure subject. You know, Andy, when I moved to Texas, I'd never been there before. Moved to Houston in 1992, and I thought of Texas as a place with cacti and cattle skulls and had no idea there was any water around. 
<laughs> but when I was in uh, practicing law in uh, Texas, I happened to be in, in Dallas County Court at Law Number 3, I think waiting for a jury to finish or something like that. And I was waiting in the hallway, and I saw this picture of the Texas Navy flag, and there was a little uh, a plaque underneath it that talked about how the Texas Navy had captured Cozumel in 1837, the, the island off the Mexican coast, and claimed it for Texas. Well, my first thought was, you know, why didn't these guys uh, keep tech, keep Cozumel for Texas? I would have loved to have had that as part of the nation. <laughs> um, but I, so I started looking into it, and uh, that became a magazine article, then a book, then then truly a labor of love. And and the more I dug into the rich Texas naval traditions and what they did with so little, uh, the more fascinating the story became. That's great. So. Okay, so the question then becomes, why didn't we keep Cozumel? It sounds like <laughs> yeah. it would have been a good thing. You know, I, I, I wish we had. Uh, apparently what happened, and this was part of the first Texas Navy, uh, the Navy's ships landed at Cozumel. They uh, beached a bunch of Marines and sailors who rounded up the islanders that they could find. They made a makeshift flagpole. They ran the Texas flag up to the top of the pole, and they made all the islanders swear allegiance to Texas. Then the next day, they took the flag down, got back in their ships, left, never to be seen again. And, and the islanders probably just shrugged and went back to whatever they were doing. Okay. Uh, missed opportunity, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You bet. Okay. We have a question from Jacob. Uh, he wants to know, he says, I'm an undergraduate history student writing my honors thesis on the sloop Austin and mm -hmm. the Battle of Campeche. Oh. And he wants to know if he can get in touch with you. Uh, and if you would be willing to talk to him. Absolutely. I'm at the law firm of King and Spalding in Atlanta, and you can find me on the website. Uh, my uh, AOL address is uh, John. Uh, we, we can, we, uh, I can, uh, I have his contact information. Oh, okay. Perfect. I'll, I'll, pa I'll pass that along to you uh, offline. All right. Great. Thanks. So uh, it'll be good to talk to you, Jacob. Uh, we have another question. Is there a source for the plan? Uh, of the sloop Austin, the sloop of war Austin. The we don't have the plans or blueprints for them. Uh, we can find a good deal of the specifications in the Dawson contract, which is at the Texas State Library and Archives. Um, I made a copy of it back before the days of digital photographs, and I'm not even sure that I, I still have it. But uh, the the specifications for the Dawson contract in the Texas Navy papers is what you, you would be looking for. Okay. Um, uh, we have another question. Um, in your research on the Texas Navy and writing your book, what did you come across that really surprised you that you weren't, that you weren't expecting? Oh, great question. I think the biggest surprise was how much the water, the Gulf of Mexico, the even the river mouths, affected the lives of Texians. Uh, remember, they were out on the frontier. Uh, when they first got there in the 1830s, there was very little, and the goods that they needed to make life palatable were all coming through water. And I think the, the need for commerce, the need for ships, the need for a Navy was something that I really did not comprehend. Uh, and, and that affected not just the military, but also the economic life of Texas. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Richard, uh, and he wants to know uh, what role did the Marines on the Austin play in the battle? That's a that's a good question. The Marines played role central roles in a number of places. Uh, they were landing parties. Uh, they were there to prevent the the sailors from. They were to keep security on the ship, uh, protect the lives of the officers. And they would tend to fight they, under Texas regulations. They did not have to go up into the up into the rigging. They could just fight from the decks if they wanted to. Uh, the ship, the the Battle of Campeche, however, really took place at vast distances, far far more than a musket would be able to fire. Um, so the picture you see on the screen of these ships getting pretty close in, almost within hollering distance. Those are done because that makes a better picture, but the reality they were is that they were farther out. So they didn't play much of a role in this particular battle, though they did go ashore in Campeche, and a number of sailors and Marines did take turns with some of the uh, the, 
the, the, the castle guns and fired some of them. Okay. Uh, we have uh, not a question, but a comment uh, from Michael uh, in New Zealand. That was excellent. And thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I think I think he's I think he's watching us uh, there early Friday morning, uh, if I understand my international date line thing right, uh, yeah. which I think is probably about the farthest you can get from Texas. So well, exactly without coming back. So th right. Michael, thank you for tuning in. Right. Oh, and and Richard Richard asked. I suspected this might be the case, but uh, the reason he asked about the Marines um, is because his great great grandfather was uh, William. Uh, William Cook, uh, who went aboard Cook with an E, uh, who went aboard the the Austin at New Orleans just before they sailed and and was served as captain of, of Marines. Absolutely, the uh, Marines did play a, a a stronger role probably in the earlier years of the Texas Navy. Interesting little fact: uh, they were armed with Sam Colt's first uh, su commercially successful revolver, the so-called Patterson, and uh, so. Uh, uh, Sam Colt after the Battle of Campeche, and I'll see if uh, if I've got uh, if I can pull it up here. After the battle, Sam Colt honored the Texas Navy by um, uh, etching the Battle of there we go etching a, a picture of the Battle of Campeche onto the cylinder of his revolver that was ultimately called the 1851 Navy Revolver. It wasn't just issued to the Navy. It was one of the most used uh, pistols in the Civil War, but it was called the Navy because Sam Houston was grateful for the, the Texas Navy buying his, his products. Uh, okay, Michael Michael responds that I got the time wrong. It's it's lunchtime in New Zealand on Friday. So, excellent, excellent. So, okay, uh, Johnny wants to know, besides Galveston, what other ports did the Texas Navy operate out, out of? The uh, Texas Navy did some work in Matagorda. Uh, Commodore Moore, during some of the, the lull in fighting, used his ships to do surveys of Galveston Harbor and around Matagorda. Um, those were the two places. Uh, and then at the mouth of the Brazos River near Velasco, uh, that was also important for the Texas Navy, more during the Revolution than during this time. Okay. Uh, and we have uh, another question. Um, um, what, in your research, what unanswered questions? Um, uh, your your book is, I think, the most, the best uh, comprehensive history of the Texas Navy during the entire during the entire period of its existence. But what unanswered questions are there left um, that that you have? Oh, that's 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 a great question. Um, one of them, which which I've I, I always thought would make a great a great novel, uh, was the the fate of the San Antonio. Remember that was the schooner whose officers mutinied. Uh, they actually killed one of their officers with one of those Texas Patterson revolvers, and that officer was actually the son of a Washington hotel proprietor who was instrumental in getting. Sam Colt to sell those pistols to Texas. So it was a strange turn of fate. But the ship, uh, the, the schooner disappeared afterward. And there were rumors that it became a slave ship, uh, that it became a pirate ship, that it uh, became, it, it, was, it was rumored to be a ghost like the Flying Dutchman. Knowing what happened to that ship would be, uh, I think, fascinating. Okay. Uh, it would. It would. That that is that certainly is one of the great mysteries, uh, unsolved mysteries of the Texas Navy. Marvin wants to know: Did you ever run across John T. K. Lothrop in your research? Commodore Moore was his executor when he died at Washington on the Brazos, uh, and he's looking for Lothrop's burial site. Okay, that first of all, that is a wonderful question. Lothrop was instrumental. He was he was Moore's right hand man by the time of the. Battle of Campeche. He appears in uh, to the people of Texas in a number of places. He was that second in command who uh, who Moore was supposed to turn his command over to in New Orleans. Uh, the commissioners agreed that he did not have to, and he commanded the uh, the Wharton. So he plays a pivotal role. And I thought I saw sometime where he was buried, but I don't recall off the top of my head. So I'll, I'll have to think about that. We can we can we can look into that and see if we can find an answer to that. Um, 
Are there any more questions? Now's the time to ask. Okay, well, John, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We appreciate it tremendously. Uh, I know you have better things to do on a Thursday night. Uh, but, I don't. I don't. This has been a genuine pleasure, Andy. So thank you for having me. Uh, this is this is this has been great. I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues in the Texas Navy Association uh, for their work in making this thing happen. And uh, again, we hope we hope we're going to be able to do one of these again soon. Thank you all very much for joining us. I'd like to thank Jonathan Jordan for this very informative presentation tonight. I'd also like to thank the Texas Maritime Museum for their generous support. Finally, I'd like to thank the webinars committee for their efforts in putting this together. I invite you to go out and look at the Texas Navy website. On it, we have a vast amount of historical information. We also have a ship store where you can purchase Texas Navy articles and art, including the painting behind them. We also have a membership section that explains how to go about joining our organization. So thank you. Have a great evening.